against it, flashing in, trying to get those Cosmic Bindings, consistently missing them. And of course, the two things that we're critical of right now are the Bard and the Ash, and those were the priority picks in Game 1. The things that Immortals wanted to get their hands on were willing to give up the Rek'Sai 4, and it just, of course, did not pan out. Now, Immortals taking a chance to ban Lee Sin, LeBlanc ban on the side, opposite side for Kongdu Monster. What do they need to change here in picks and bans? Is it just that Ezreal? Is this the time now where you put Flame on a carry and just say, you know, screw what's strong and we'll just play what's comfortable? Uh, I think that is definitely an option. I'd like to see Flame on Cannon again, and you like, again, you use Dardag on top side to kind of play around that lane and try and snowball that way. I think Immortal's composition was okay before. I think their, their strategy made a lot of sense, but their execution in the mid game was like such a big issue for them because they never understood how to actually play on all three lanes. They would always forget the one lane where Kessipi went to and had to go catch waves all the time. They never got to group when they were pushing in waves more than like once at a dragon. So their mid game was just too slow from them and we saw Liquid have the same issue yesterday and it is a very traditional Western issue against Korean teams. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a couple things open right now for Immortals if they want to go for it. I mean, the Rek'Sai would be a, a safe first pick, but the Rise is still on the table, and I think that that might have to just be a snatch up here uh, for them for Pobelter in the mid lane. And of course, Cassio taking off the board as well, so that counter pick that we saw used so frequently both throughout the group stages and yesterday in our first semifinal not on the line, or not available. Uh, Rankar also once again banned out by Kongdu Monster, but the Thresh is up and available. Uh, I mean, I don't really think Thresh deserves the ban priority no, that he's agree. getting. So I, I think just getting an extra ban here, essentially, just making sure that the mid lane champion pool is shut down. Now, I do think the Rise uh, sets up Immortals, Immortals for that potential cannon pick later, where they want to run like 1-3-1 one, one comps, and you have two very strong side lane players um, that can actually like kind of split up Kongru monsters, and you don't just hop into pure team fights. And then once you get to late game, Rise can really become that monster we know he can be. But still a lot of picks to go. They might still just go full tank comp and say, we just have good scaling again. We just can do exactly what we did last. Last game, but just have a much better mid game. Cody Sun's pick though is interesting. I think still going Ash is okay for the utility, but I, Ezreal is available. I mean, this is like the same, it's the same uh, like mode of thinking here with the Jin if they were gonna lock that in, still have that long range utility to try to slow people up with the curtain call, but they are gonna go with the Ezreal. And I, I do like this a bit more. This is gonna make him be safer. You also have the Thresh coming in for Ole. Did play this before in the group stage. Wasn't the best performance as well on that, but this is a champion historically that he is uh, fairly strong on. Yeah, we saw this exact bot lane yesterday from Liquid where they actually played against Karma support as well. And it's a bot lane if you're really strong, if you have well-performing support, especially on Thresh, that can actually have kill pressure and do really well in this 2v2. The problem is if the Thresh starts missing some of these hooks, you just get destroyed in that lane. You lose your tower as well. So this is really Immortal saying that they trust in that bot lane to actually play out this lane properly. Otherwise, Kongu is going to get a free tower like in the last game. Ten minutes in, Kongu took the tower 2v2. And I'm really wondering what the priority is on the Rise pick. Oh, they have to put so much confidence into Pobelters to see the Twitch locked in because they gave up Karma Rek'Sai as the first rotation with Zyra taken off the board. So Kongu set themselves up for a winning bottom lane off the start, and I don't feel like it's the same story uh, on the side of Immortals. Definitely uh, a tough pick and man phase so far for Immortals. Feeling like they had to take that Rise first pick. And yeah, again oh. with the skill matchup in bot lane that was lost by Immortals in the last game. Twitch I actually really like against Ezreal. You can hide behind your own minions and you can just put a W down and kind of take the trades with them. The first three levels can be rough, but then once you get past like level four, you're going to be more than fine. And Sol has been so good in fights in terms of his positioning. Give him camouflage as well. So he can sneak around wards and everything and then just pop out of nowhere and actually destroy the team. So Hecarim as an answer and Malka as an answer against Twitch is good because you have things that can now dive onto the backline. If Paul Builder can find a proper flank, they can kill Soul. But this requires Immortals to play really well in fights. Like in my opinion, Immortals comp is actually hard to execute and they didn't show good execution in the last game. And that is where they now have to really show how good they can be in the mid to late game fights. Of course, we look at the Hecarim pick, though. It is very powerful for the Snowballs. A similar story for the Rise pick. So maybe if Immortals can find that similar early game lead, they may not have to fight on the terms, may not have to fight even team fights. But of course, inside of Kongdu Monster, Twitch feels like the inevitability card. Once you get to the late game, there's nothing you're going to be able to do that against that. Orianna, a similar story, especially with the Poppy and Rek'Sai delivery systems. Uh, what are Immortal shots here to pull this one out? What are we looking for from this team to, to find a win? We need a better performance in the bot lane 2v2. For sure. Ollis, especially on the Thresh, has to play really flawless here to make sure they get through this laning phase. Dardak needs to get fed on the Hecarim. Trinity Force coming in early from him. Have these two guys that can dive the backline, him and Flame, and actually take down Soul. And Poe Builder on Rise. 
needs to be able to split push and then flank in these fights, but it requires coordination and perfect execution. And that is tough for a new squad. Yeah, and, and as well, like once Stardock hits that level six point, he can't be overzealous. He can't just be going in with the onslaught of shadows repeatedly because he's not going to be tanking for quite some time. And once that Twitch can get some items in, he's going to start shredding. Of course, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. The second match, will Immortals be able to bring it back to three games, or will Kongu close it out with the 2 0? We're going to send it over to Freak and Papa Smithy as we get into our second game in this series. Summoner's Rift, everybody. We are here to witness game two between Immortals and Kong the boss. Monster. Sure, but that's expected. You can see that on the screen. No big deal. I am Freak here with Papa Smithy. We are ready to bring you another game. Now, hopefully this will get resolved soon enough. But as we had seen, heading into the game, yes, Kong Doom Monster had won game number one. It was a very close one, but it was a very good mid to late game shot calling. And I think some major mid to late game shot calling mistakes from Immortals to allow a lot of those victories to happen. Nonetheless, a fairly secure victory by the end of it all. And now it's Immortals who have to turn around and bring it to game three. Yeah, that, the veteran status and uh, rookie status, you have to say, of the rosters in terms of how they're gelling was on full display in that mid game, but not in the early game. And that's where the NA fans in both series have had things to be excited about. Just so you guys know, on your screen, Flame is having a small mic issue. so. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be corrected momentarily. But it gives us a bit more time to dive into the comps that we're seeing. And, and look at Flame. That's true. It's That's a zoomed-in shot of just Flame. This is this is an NA fan dream right here because yeah. next year you're going to see plenty of Flame. That's true. In person, if you really want, show up to the studio. No big deal. Nine weeks of What's play. What's the address there? Come on, let's complete the plug. Uh... I, want, I, think it's one, I think it's 12312 West Olympic Boulevard. There you go. Plug that into your Uber. There you go. Get to the, stu the studio. In Los Angeles, California, 90064, I believe, is the entire address. Damn, now you can deliver pizzas there. Uh, I mean, I've, I've accidentally ordered food there. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, Were you at home or at the studio? Well, uh, I mean, to be fair, I've, uh, I've unaccidentally ordered food to the <laughs> studio. Um, That's perfect. And, and then had it saved on the profile and then accidentally ordered food to the studio <laughs> uh, when I meant to send it to home. So... Uh, but that, that's, that's off topic. Actually, although I know, you know occasionally you guys have to fill a long time with the OGM broadcast, usually uh, we're a bit sharper or we have an analyst that's to toss to in North America, that's so true. I feel less bad, or I feel more bad just like talking about delivering food. Well, we have an analyst desk, but I refuse to toss them. I yeah, want no, no, no. more about we food. Are, I mean, some of their headsets are off right now, but we are much more intelligent and better commentators than I can see Achilles and Division right there. But they can't hear me. But trust me, we are better than them. Uh, the fact that they're not chiming in to correct means that they agree as well. It's good times, good times. And the comps here are interesting too. Let's, let's talk about a little bit yes, of League absolutely. of Legends. I know that's novel, but we'll throw it in there. Hecarim Jungle from Dardock, I think, is interesting. Sure. And Previous we saw game he played Gragas, now he's on Hecarim. And we saw the Hecarim from Rainover as well. So true, true. It was one of those names after Lee Sin, after Rek'Sai, that people are like, okay, this stuff is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I like it here is consider the threats on the side of Kongdu Monster, specifically Twitch and Orianna. Both of them want to open up far from the fight, or at least Orianna wants to be dictating the fight from out of range or using the shield to get a lot of her initiation in. Hecarim dives in. One of Orianna and Twitch is going to have to flash or really get the heck out of dodge. At the same time, maybe Maokai's flanking yep. in. Maybe Ryze has plopped Thresh on top of someone or Thresh has hit a hook. There's so much to respect that there has to be fights, you'd have to think, where one of Orianna and, and Twitch will not be able to do damage, or yes. at least set up the way they want to. I agree. I think there's a lot of very interesting mechanical interactions here. So Orianna and Twitch, as you're mentioning very heavily, low escape, low mobility champions that are easily beset by a Maokai flank or Hecarim ultimate, or, or even a, a, a Realm Warp from Pro Belter's Rise, you can get on these carries. Now that said, it's a double shield comp from Kondu Monster. Yep. Edge and Gugur on the Orianna and Karma can shield the target required. What's also nice for Immortals is that Cody Sun's playing Ezreal, a champion that has backline reach for the Marksman role. So he can actually help those dives go even better. 
cancel out one of the shields with a true shot barrage. And a lot of people are embracing the camouflage mechanics and the long, the longer time in stealth that it gives Twitch. And in some ways, that's beneficial, especially roaming between lanes. What's really important for him here is that you know he'll have that Q max second very comfortably. He can take, I believe it's 12 to 13 seconds to open up for the first time. And that's so much time where maybe they're DPSing down a front line of Rebottles. Maybe Hecarim's like, wait, where the hell is this Twitch? I want to take him down. Yeah. And if he can open up exactly where he wants with the pass through damage, even though on paper there's a lot of ways to get to the Twitch, you have to be able to see him to open up exactly like you want to for Immortals. I would agree. Yeah, 10 to 14 seconds, the duration of stealth, and he maxes it second. So by late game team finds it will be 14. You can see the early shove for Kongdi Monster. No surprise at all. Karma outpushes Thresh. Who would have thought? And, and it looks like the last under turret well enough. And the other fun thing is that now with the change to the Venom cast, Twitch outpushes Ezreal even more than he used to because he can just plop the cast onto the minion wave, wait a few seconds, get that expunge on a full minion wave. And this matchup's actually gone further in the advantage of yes. Twitch. Sure, there's a world where Ezreal can get in there and assassinate him 1v1. Yeah. But apart from that, in the 2v2 laning phase, Kongdu Monster actually have a far superior duo lane to yeah. Immortal. I agree that Twitch definitely got a lot better with the changes. For what it's worth, uh, Immortal support Ole on this Thresh got a better laning mastery as well, though, now that you can use Courage of the Colossus. Yep. It allows you to be much tankier. Before, you could actually focus Thresh in a team fight or in, a, in an all-in, and it wasn't the worst thing in the world. But now with the extra couple hundred HP from the Thresh Courage of the Colossus shield, it's much less an opportunity, and it does help a little bit with Immortals 2 on 2. I think it's really strong in laning. In the late game, you're still pretty squishy, right? You're still going to yeah. walk that primary member and die. I guess maybe you can flash away instead of just being instantly deleted with your 2,000 health. But yeah. in the laning phase especially, the level 2, level 3 trades, when you have access to all your ability, you're surprisingly tanky with the Courage of the Colossus. So especially now, before we see the nurse, the laning pattern here, hit a hook, go in, and maybe get some damn good trades against Kongdu Monster. As long as you're not inside of a gigantic menu, if you know Karma can lock you up easily. We're seeing Dardock look for his first gank. He's trying to figure out what he can slink around. But optimistic? A little bit optimistic, yeah. I mean, you can land for Nenna sometimes if the play is oh going right now. The flash that's going to be the CC. Land a Googer flashing the wall, but now has nowhere to go. So he flashes just to delay his death, which maybe means something, but Cody's son 99.99 .99 times out of 100, he gets this kill. And they're going to give it over to Dardic. He doesn't want to give up an entire lane's worth of XP and gold. Gugger buying a lot of time. The Satchel, yep, buys even more time. Uh, was he hit there? He might execute. He, he actually might execute here. Fobalt is showing up. And instead, it's the mid laner getting the kill. This Rune Prison is going to be there. time wasted. It's true, but it's at the very least Dardock and Fobalt are wasting their time. Okay, nothing went over to the bottom lane, so Cody Sun and Ole didn't gain anything specifically other than two on one time in lane, but suddenly, it's a first blood for Poe Belter when he wasn't supposed to be involved at all. Now, only thing that you could say that was good from Kongdu is that Dardock did use Ghost for completely no reward, but the kill going over to Poe Belter is even more ideal kill participation than the Hecarim. It's actually a bit of a line ball there just because Hecarim wants to go Trinity Force into Tanky without building anything else. So mm -hmm. Hecarim picking up the gold maybe might be ideal. Oh, Goals what up. a sick hook by Ole. He's alone right now. It's a hard 1v2. Soul does have some. He flashes. Lantern to follow a bit more, and they can't get enough damage. He's still got heal. Cody Sun gets the Q, so good by Soul to get away from that fight. I feel like Immortals could have cheated a bit farther up and make the flash a bit worse, but the fact that, that was only a summoner burn is pretty insane. Oh, man. The best players in the world play on the edge of madness. You know, play on that razor's edge between just misposition and ideal positioning in terms of getting minions, in terms of trades. Soul overstayed in lane because he wanted to get certain CS values because he did not feel threatened. Really nice mechanical play from Ole. But for Soul to not even have to blow his heal and survive and even be able to continue laning now that Gugu's back in lane is is the most beneficial and the biggest way you can turn a terrible situation for the Twitch. Definitely agree, but right now we are in a game where Immortals hold on to a pretty comfortable 5 six on our gold lead. It's actually better than it was before. Remember in game one, they were losing kind of all the lanes that weren't named after Flame very early on, and this time around the CS numbers quite a bit closer. A lot of that, of course, Gugger out of the lane for 45 seconds at a time, but it's made this game even better early than it was in game one. Are able to take stock. You know, I talked about the optimistic gank path, but LA has been on point. You know, the dark passage into the flash instant E was actually really strong there. Got them the kill they were looking for, even though it was very, very delayed. 
And now there are certainly patterns to play around. Yeah. Don't have vision of either side of the jungles. They have to respect Dardog potentially being around. They probably don't respect level six. If he pulled up, picked up the kill, maybe there would be a world where he had enough experience, but not really realistic, not really worth playing around. Very much an edge case scenario. And now we see Punch actually trying to get them that information they're looking for. Ooh, and actually is going to reveal Dardoch, so nicely played right there. They know where the Immortals jungler is, and you can have Kongdu Monster play around that. Of course, same simil same scenario here with that Satchel, not Satchel, uh, Scryer's Bloom being hit. You know that Punch is around there as well, so similar info gained. And unlucky for Flame, couldn't quite root Roach inside of turret range. The shield bounced outside anyway, so the root didn't really matter. Cody's son going to have to respect this a little bit. Does have to burn Arcane Shift. They're running a little bit low on mana now. Continue now. Sinmark guys do pretty damn well in the 1v1s here. Oh, can be used a bit more liberally by Flame. It does have a longer one. Oh, bone lane. Here's the attempt in. Googer in on the Cody Sun. Not enough damage there, but Soul's going to be an easy pickup. Does not have Flash. Means the solo kill comes through, plus the 2 on 2 on this one. Nicely played. I think Ole helped set the one up at least a little bit in the Dardot gank. Incredibly important. Does mean that the blue up can be stolen away by Punch. And this Kondo Monster is not playing around their vision. They had a control ward down, they had wards in the brush, but nice gank angle from Dada. Didn't even have six. That was only the ghost being back off cooldown. We're going to see the replay. Let's look for the, vi the time when Kondo realized right now, trouble. Scene. Just now is. And in Soul stays. Yeah, because of the hook coming through. Soul could have tried to peace out. We're not 100% sure if he had Q up. It looks like he did, but it wasn't going to mean yeah, much. The camouflage isn't going to be the same as the stealth previously. Two big kills, and Kongdo now trying to force him. And Roach rooted in turret range means several hundred damage dealt. Nice flash to get away from Shockwave. That was crucial from Flame. This could be bad. Uh, yeah, too much turret damage Ooh. here. It's warmed up way too heavily, and Flame outplaying the 1v3 gank, losing flash, but worth it. And now this is suddenly an even bigger lead than we saw in the yeah. previous game. Things are going right for Immortals and going woeful for Kongdu. Whenever they are making their moves, they're getting no trades for it. 1,600 gold, eight minutes in. Okay, they're keeping their buffs. Okay, it's not a disaster, but there's multiple members, and of course we do have great scaling, being able to go selfish build, builds and scaling builds on side of Immortals, and no punishment from Kongdu Monster. I gotta say, I'm thinking about that bot lane gank though, and real. Oh, this is so slick. Lantern uh -oh. over Roach does have flash, gets rooted up. He can't get in on Dardock because of the W, doesn't really matter though. Ole sadly steals the kill away, but I think it was the right choice. If Roach ease into flash, he's out of that gank. So, uh, Ole, smart to actually just land the auto attack. Roach probably would have lived or forced Dardock's ult if he didn't auto there. So, the, smart by Ole to steal. And the Anos Desk was, you know, wondering about Ezreal. Taking away the Ezreal inside of Immortals, one thing Ezreal does do, can snipe away CS from very yeah. far. Sure doesn't have a lot of lane control. Best 1v2 AD carry by exactly. far. Exactly, and Ole can leave lane. We've already seen his Thresh mechanics. This game's certainly on point, more so than his Bard mechanics last game. Allowed him to roam, and they're getting the benefit from that. And sure, some turret damage from Kongdu, but unless that turret damage turns into first brick, it's not a massive cost for Immortals. Absolutely the case. Yes, it's some damage, but you're right, the the, the, broke, the break point is not how much damage the turret deals, it's if the health bar reaches zero right now, and it's the important thing to look for. It's certainly a possibility here for Kongdu Monster to go for it. But it's a thing that's changed, it's worth knowing, because of course yeah. in the past, having three low turrets was less consequential. It was actually pretty good, you'd probably prefer that than actually breaking the first, but with the first brick gold and how much that snowballs the early game, it yeah. is so crucial to DPS it down first rather than prep multiple lanes to give inevitable gold in a few minutes time. So Punch is going to chill, going to wait to tunnel out until after Edge gets the kill. There we go, two blue offs in a row for Edge in the mid lane. Of course, they stole the earlier blue away from Dardox jungle because he ganked bot lane. So looking to do something a little bit cheeky. I like this word right here. If you put it too far down, the turret can see it, but this guarantees they know if Thrash is waiting behind the wall and it it's out of range of the pink board earlier in that brush. It's just very optimally placed. And that's the big story there is that, look, they now have 100% con a 100% uh, confirmation of the control ward. They would have suspected it before, yes. but it does show you if Thresh exits lane during early laning or 2v2 laning patterns, whereas he could be out of the brush. He could be looking to land in someone. And it gives you a lot of information. He can't be spotted as he's the trade. Big shock with Holmes is going to have to ghost away. And yeah, I knew he couldn't take any more of that fight. If, if Edge can flash Q, Pobot who's dead. He's got to really respect this. This, this could flash, be the one. Though. Okay. Whipper belts are having flash and Edge having that information. Optimistic to think you're going to get the Q in. Product wants in, lands the E's. He's going to burn the flash away. Saving the ultimate for now. Edge is not even going to burn it. What? Why would you flash there? That is a very, very silly play. Now, Punch 
Yeah, can't find the gank. Drawdeck ults now, but here comes Soul. Pobelter, one more auto. There's the Eno gets the shield. But the ulti's enough, and Punch lands the Prey Seeker, and now Ole forced to run away. Nice job on the turnaround, Punch, and Soul making that one happen. Yeah, really unclear. We're going to have to see the replay for why he flashed at the end. He was trying to hold the flash to flash the ult, but Dardock knew exactly how much damage he did yeah. with the early Sheen. And a red well, watch the replay. If you flash, you get ulted. I understand the mind right. game there. That's why it doesn't flash so early. Flash there. But he's dead at this point. He thinks he can outrange the Q, but the range is even longer than it was previously. So Soul opens up. If the kill goes to Twitch, who doesn't want to ult, it'd be ideal. But just as he commits to ulting, Prey yep. Seeker registers, kill doesn't go to Twitch. So even the single kill on the board for Kongdu doesn't have ideal uh, gold values passed over to the Twitch. It actually only goes to the Rex side. That's right, exactly. And I believe Uber got an assist as well. Yeah, there's only one kill on the map. So Soul only got 75 gold for his. Uh, if oh, okay. Fight in the bot lane, gotta go for that one first. Ole's still taking aggro, they're He's running out. He won't burn down. I think he'll survive this, but you're seeing the summoner heal the run. Edge wants in, does have Shockwave. QR, nope, gonna have to jump that one away. Q's gonna be back up in a second. There's the attempt, and yes, Cody Sun smart to flash that one. He knew that was his fate. Still flash down, good gank. Now Flame wants in, gets the big shield, looks for a kill. Here comes the match TP from Roach. They're gonna kite back to make sure they go okay this one. Roach cancels TP, now look for the re-engage, but Flame's not a ranger of anybody else. And it's going to be Roach with a little bit of free time walking the top lane first. Flame will mirror with the recall. But it looks like a health bar lead to the bot lane for Immortals. No, it's going to be a full reset. So real important point there was that Soul had ultimate up but did not have enough mana to activate it. And in a world where there was a 4 vs 4 tank battle, he would have been the difference. He would have been able to do damage, get the reset, do a lot of damage. But because he had no mana, he wasn't able to truly engage the fight. And it was smart of Roach to not teleport in because he would have ended up baiting his team. It's very easy to see if ults are up, but the mana management and things like that are a little bit more subtle. The teleport cancel buys time. Good CS now goes over, only now just matching, unfortunately, the CS values of Flames, so not able to get a gain in bot lane. But remember, Kongdu traded pretty well. They got flashes against, uh, they had a summoner spell advantage in that trade, mm -hmm. even though it looked like Sol was going to get popped under turret. Yeah. Well, how it opened up, it ended up pretty well for sure. Kongdu Monster. Right, exactly. It didn't end up hurting too badly overall, and we just still Ooh. sit at this 2,000 gold difference. It's an early Trinity Force, yeah, yep. to save for the Hecarim. Oh, Dardak, 1337 into the game, manages to sneak all the way into this brush. Now, they know it's risky in general. They know their wards aren't perfect. They're going to find Ole, so here comes the fight. It's going to be a four-man engage. They're looking for Soul, but they don't land the True Shot Barrage at all, so it buys a lot of time. And I don't know if Dardak has the damage, the flash to fall away. Shockwave's going to land as well. Cody said finally does the turnaround. Dardak's still going to die, though. Poets are going to put out plenty nice of damage healthy. out, but he's going to find Cougar pretty easily. No, it's a good flash to get away. And long story short, two for two, a pretty close one overall. The top winners. Still trading blows. Well fought by Kongdu Monster there. It looked like it would be much worse for them, but Soul played once again on the edge, uses Flash at the last. Nice Still ends flame. up being 2v2. I That's think as Roach is going, Grasp the Undying here. He's actually got better trading as Flame in general. That cooldown is obviously much shorter than Courage of the Colossus. Flame still forcing him away, nicely played, and of course, no TP for either one means getting back to the lane is going to be hard. Punch first to get the top lane. Yeah, Roach was pulling back, waiting for the Passive to come back once again, needs that shield to win trades, otherwise it's very low. A lot of members top, remember Moby Spotted. Boots Thresh rolling in as well. Uh-oh. Yeah, here comes the Realm Warp, the tunnel cooldown is down, but Punch still gonna get tagged with a W. Not a lot more to follow through with, but hey, that's a flash forced by a, a good quick roam by Pobelter. We're seeing him play much better than I think he did earlier on in the tournament. Right, it's been a breathing room for Twitch to push up the lane, but because he's only solo, even though they prepped that outer bot lane turret earlier, I don't know if he'll be able to take it down. Cody Sun will take a time. Will take his time to get to bot lane. Rex side tunnels in. They're looking for first brick here. Will be the first major objective to Kongdu Monster this game. And they're gonna get it. There's really no chance to stop this one. So nicely played here, winning the bot lane. Oh, sorry, not first brick. It was yep. picked up a little while ago. But either way, it's still a good pickup, of course. Turret is there, nicely done. Yeah, all the earlier pressure bot lane. My bad for missing that one. Yeah, my bad as well. We didn't appreciate that it was taken down after those poor trades in bot lane. So it's only a turret, but still a turret with no cost yes. so far. A, a turret for just a little bit of time spent, but nothing really gained yet on the rest of the map. We'll see if Immortals goes for Drake. The thing is, Kongtu Monster have the health and mana bars to fight for the Ocean Drake oh, if they want to. And now it's Soul going for a big play right here, looking in on a Cody Sun. He's got to know he's very 
attackable here. And, ooh, nice knockup. Gets away from the Lantern. Now Roach gonna tackle Ole as well. They're going in for the damage up, but Cody's gonna walk away pretty safely. And now Roach attacked up by Pobo. Their hook's gonna land. Into the back line goes Dardock, but why? The rest of your team is nowhere to be found. He did not need to take that fight. Flame, of course, not matching the TP. Just gonna get some alone time of the turret, but a kill and an Ocean Drake, I think, worth it. I completely agree, Freak. It looked like Dardock was trying to buy time. There was no flame to be able to engage. His teleport was not up. So that's what the thing that Kongdu realized, is there was always going to be an outnumbered fight from their perspective. Important for them to steady their confidence, win some skirmishes. It will just be a kill and an Ocean Drake for the top lane turret. Even though Poppy is close, she will not get there soon enough. So on in terms of a gold trade, it's actually just fine from Immortal's perspective. Yeah. But it's what it means on a grander scale they'll be able to check in on in about 10 minutes time. Yeah, we're going to check in on a bit more as well with the TP advantage now being on Flame's hands. Now, there aren't a lot of objectives left to play for. It's only mid lane outer. That's pretty hard to TP flank in the general sense. But we'll see if Immortal can make a play for that part of the map. What it does mean is that only really mid lane is a safe lane for Twitch to open up in or to enter now, because if you enter top lane or bot lane, you'll just see a flank teleport and a dead Twitch. Realistically, yeah. won't be able to get away. So the options for Twitch kind of get lower. And the moment that he pushes past the, the river, uh, the double control wards or not, he will be chased down by Maokai. So difficult currently for Soul to find farm in side lane. Absolutely agree. We'll see if this is going to happen. Double tier, of course, stacking up for Immortals. Rod of Ages, two minutes in as well for Pobelter. The scaling will be immense, but never forget, Soul is probably the best player in the map right now. Very, very skilled man, and he's on Twitch, who is probably the king of late game right now as far as champions are concerned. And can definitely still carry effect by playing it properly. Absolutely an, an option for him. Not a known Twitch picker. Did not play it in the LCK or in any of the recent promotion tournaments or Kespa Cup. Now he might have played it in Challenge. I don't actually have those stats on hand. But regardless, it's not the praise, not a legacy Twitch player, but sure. very much been in the meta, has been target nerfed in future patches. Everyone's coming bot lane. Here's the attempt. Ardok wants in and a soul. Realm War gonna come in pretty quickly as well. And actually, he's gonna slink out the other side. It's sort of Still, a good kill onto the Karma. That is one picked up. Double Ghost and a Realm Warp used. Soul just running, running, running away. Has not walked through any wards. This would be a safe recall spot. And in fact, will not get killed for it. Mid lane lost an entire wave of farm. Yeah, it was smart of both the bot laners to go in different directions. Very camouflage, obviously. It makes it even easier for Soul because he's going to be able to evade wards. Taking the path that he did. Mortal's trying to collapse on bot lane and pushing up bot lane as well. Macro game looking pretty damn sturdy for Immortals. And the teleport wasn't invested in either. Ooh, nice struggle catch it. Oh, here comes the dive onto the backside. Oh, Stardock wants a bit more, but there are no minions to tank the turret anymore. That shockwave actually saves several thousand turret HP, even if it doesn't become a kill. So smart by Edge to go for that one. Yeah, I think that was literally just a wave for shockwave. I don't think he was hoping for any more than that, realistically. His health bar wasn't the highest either, so it was more just again delaying the mid lane turret going down. Top lane turret is down, bot lane turret is down. When that trifecta of outer turrets goes down, there are no safe places to be on the map against teleport from flame, uh, Ooh, ghosting they Hecarim they or Bobelter. this Rizal even. And he's like, oh, this is scary for me, he's gonna walk away, but Cougar wants a bit more and doesn't want to bite into the Rise. That was an interesting battle where they didn't have direct vision, but they all knew where each other were. Yeah, if Soul had Infinity Edge, he'd have enough single target damage to actually Probably. trouble the Rise right now. Very much more of the team fight build with the Hurricane, but Infinity Edge surely coming out before too long. Yeah, let's see what we get for ourselves here. Plenty of damage on this mid outer turret. Doing a bit of work, down a half HP here, and here we go. Roach on the wings, and doesn't leave the W in range. Walks away from Flame, who gets flanked out by Ole. 3 0 still on this Ezreal tier, still stacking. Trinity Force done. Cooldown boots in there as well. Plenty of damage up it here for Cody Sun. Got to make sure he has the uptime to actually carry the fights. And he's going for the Leandri, sorry, not the Leandri, the uh, Luton's Echo yes. build on the Oriana. We saw Bjergsen doing this at All-Star. It has become more and more of a favorite build. Gone are the days of mana regen into Death Cap, or Death Cap second. Yep. Uh, there's kind of justifications depending on how the game is going. If the Oriana's snowballing, it's more burst. If she's behind, it's a cheaper power spike. And also the movement speed in this game could be pretty consequential. Let's see if there's actually follow-up damage oh, here. It's a slow, gets the root in. They really want to take down Punch. Let's see if they can do it. Not much more to do, though, for Flame. And looks like it's a, a couple of minor cooldowns burned. 
Cobalt's or Cody Sun back into the mid lane just to clear the minions a little bit faster. Why not save a few seconds? A minute and 20 until the Drake respawns and the Realm Warp should be up by then anyway. Just to finish the point on Ludens, I think the 10% move speed against the likes of the Hecarim, the Rise, just giving Orianna a hope in hell of being able to actually sidestep one of these engages when her flash is down. Because otherwise, you go Death Cap, your flash is down. Basically, your position has to be the most conservative possible, whereas an extra 10% move speed might give her other options in fights. Waiting to see how things come together. Still no Infinity Edge for Soul. That's where Twitch really starts to get ahead. Behind in CS and Cody Sun this time in a good place. Two items, yep. not quite Mirror Mana. Plenty of mobility on this Ezreal. No real excuses given the position for Cody Sun to not actually right. have a positive impact in fights. And Cognitive Monster, yes, they have the Rek'Sai and the Poppy. Those champions can reach backline, but generally speaking, I feel like Cognitive here are going to be a very frontline focused team, especially when they're playing double shield of the Twitch. You're just going to kind of line up and hope you can fight like a 1776, really. We saw that particular duo actually struggle to hold down the Vayne uh, yeah. in Liquid's game, where you either get on top of the Ezreal or Vayne in this case, burn them down instantly, or you get kited. That's just the reality. Ezreal has so much mobility that you can kite in the back line. And it's very difficult to instantly burst down an Ezreal with all the mobility. We saw the frustrations that Immortals themselves had trying to lock down uh, Soul in the previous game. So it is a great spot for cody Sun, and we'll see if he can actually translate that into the fight impact he needs to have. Rest of Immortals in a pretty good spot as well. Looking for this Infernal Drake, easily enough to pick up. Good for them. Three and a half thousand gold lead. Infernal versus Ocean. See if they have enough damage as they continue to try to play for map control. They have definitely been stymied for a while. The last thing they gained was this Infernal Drake. Feels like Still not getting the mid turret. It's like in League of Legends, we don't follow the Pokemon rules. I don't know if Ocean beats Fire. No. Not Unlikely. in fights. Not in fights, so. Nintendo but and Riot disagreeing on philosophy, I guess. I, I suppose so a little bit. Uh, it is worth noting, though, that the, the types of things teams get away with is now a little bit different. Kongdu Monster, you actually saw, for example, when that mid lane wave shockwave came in and, and Edge got chunked, he was able to stay in mid lane because of Ocean Drake. He, he was at under half HP, would have been forced to recall if not for a Drake take. I, I mean that very sincerely. And that ended up, you know, granting him a couple more minutes of wave clear when he wasn't diveable. I choose to think that's slightly glass half full, but I do track what you're saying. It can lead to patterns that just won't happen if you don't have right. any regen. And and that's really what I think is, is interesting, just to, as this game is a bit slower, talking about things like Mountain, Ocean, and, and Cloud Drakes is Infernal is always useful no matter what you're doing. You can last hit a bit easier, you can sometimes bring people out, but you're allowed to play differently sometimes with these other Drakes. We're seeing an attempt here and for the mid lane. They're not going to run away for this one. Pops his ghost actually was afraid of Punch getting the knock up into a shockwave. And Dardoch saving that cooldown. Ole chunked down. You can see the Luden's Echo extra damage. Definitely helping. And now the word respect has to come up because suddenly we're seeing some very respectful plays from Dardoch using his ghost in that scenario. Ghost actually opens up damage for someone like a Hecarim. Soul. That's Punch Soul coming. Into lane here. Could be a very scary 2 on 2 on towards Bull Belter. And that's going to be another escape away. Ghost popped by the rise. Just for a regular tunnel cooldown, that is a summer spell down. But the moment Infinity Edge is complete and ult is popped from Twitch, you're suddenly not tanky if you're Dardoch. Yeah, you've got to be respectful. The uh, Flame has one armor item and the Ninja Tabi, so it's getting there. It's mm -hmm. not quite there yet. But Dardoch, for soul. Dardoch is health and damage. He's got nothing yeah. else going, so he has to be respectful. Even Swifty boots, right? So missing a lot of those tools. So we'll see if they can poke down on Edge. Of course, extra mana regen never hurt either. As Flame continues to try to fight with Roach, who also gets to benefit from the Ocean Drake regen, and maybe gets a bit more wave control because of it. I actually misunderstood Infernal Edge. Uh, sorry, Infernal Edge. Uh, Infernal Drake. The mm. first time it was, I actually thought it was eight percent extra AD and AP, only counting towards champion damage. Ah, yeah, it's everything. And when I realized it was everything, then suddenly it just to me that's why it was that rapid ascent because it even helps you to take the neutrals that ten percent sure. bonus damage to Baron and turrets does, so it is, in fact, that uh, every man Drake It does everything. It does everything. A little bit of everything. Finally, they do get down. Nicely done. The mid lane turret that they've been looking for. And this is where Immortals should have to play very smartly around Baron, because they've got that outer ring of turrets down. In fact, only a single turret down for Kongdu, and they have space both to push up vision and get the picks that should cement their lead with the Baron that should actually close out the game. And it's going to... I mean, it definitely looks better than it did in game one. 
Immortals holding on to a solid 5,000 yep. gold lead. It's a greater than 10% gold difference. That's always the mark I look at. Greater than 10% starts to really mean something. Just it's an easy break point to look at. It is slow going for them, and this team does have reasonably good siege tools. They have two good divers, their their two major carries are ranged. Sometimes you've got champions like Echo where sieging turrets is very hard, or champion like Vayne where sieging turrets is very hard. This is not the case here for Immortals, and it, it does feel a little bit slow for me, but all that said, they are winning, they are doing a good job. We're not seeing these major mistakes where they're giving these openings away. They're not, you know, letting Drake sneak out from under them. They're not giving away free turrets they shouldn't be, so uh, progress is still forward even if slightly slow. And they have the natural answers to the gambits that Kong do any. Specifically, as I said, I don't really know what a true 5v5 team fight looks like where both Edge and Soul are doing damage without a huge pick. And speaking of picks, it's gonna be Flame looking for the big TP. Let's see if they can find it. a bit of a slow on a punch. Actually misses the hook, he expected the dodge, didn't happen. And that's Soul getting caught out here to the mix. And that's the pick up by Pobelter. Nicely played by Dardak. Ole has the shield, he's fine for this one. Shockwave flashed away by Pobelter. Means a kill onto Edge. That's two for zero so far. Let's see if they can find anything more on this one. At the very least, it should be a turret or another major objective. Oh, Look at that, oh. Pobelter. Q, W, Q, E, Q, all the damage he needs. Nice pickup, and that's going to mean, actually, 6,000 gold lead plus Baron. And that just shows what I was going to get to, which was the comp answers the questions, especially ahead that Kongdo are posing out. There's no way for Orion and Twitch to do damage when there's a flank, when Hecarim can ult in. They're turning on to Baron. Optimistic to try to interrupt this one. Back, back two. I'm just here. gonna tackle Darda. Good damage there, but the Baron is not reset yet. But Ole is getting low. Keep uh -oh. in mind, Punch is around. They've gotta land this smite. It's gonna be a close timing effort. Cody goes for the kill. Smartly played early smite. Ooh, that could have been a steal by Roach because of the bad smite timing. But it still does mean the Baron's picked up and the delayed Ace picked up. 13 to 4, 9,000 gold lead. Yeah, the game completely exploded here, and Immortals finally have the lead that cements another good early game for an NA team versus Korean team. Soul DPS out. All the different flanks that Immortals can come from negates champions like Orianna and Twitch, especially if you're ahead, especially when you have the outer ring of turrets down. Suddenly there's so many avenues for Ryze to show up, for, he for Hecarim to engage, for the Maokai to come. Multiple flanks, not even including things like the Realm Warp, answered first Soul, then Edge, then Kongdu Monster, and now they're in a massive hole against Immortals. And of course a massive lead similarly for Immortals, depending on which reference point you use to look at this game. I have to give a lot of props, honestly, to Dardock. It's two games in a row, and pretty much every game this entire tournament, he has got his team the early lead via his ganking. Dardock, from statistics, especially in the first 10 minutes, feels like maybe the best jungler at this tournament. Just in terms of results, you can say the pedigree is different for someone like Ambition, and that might be true, but Dardock has gotten several great ganks off with a team that often has had losing lanes, so I've got to give him a lot of credit. His team fight right there was great as well. 3 to an 8 is a wonderful scoreline. 11 out of 13 KP is a great mark here, and it's going to be very tanky as he crashed into this late game. And it's not trivial that he's doing that on picks like the Hecker in this game, where he was on the same wavelength as his Korean support Ole in the early game when they went for that big flash engage, uh, the flash engage with the Thresh. And then working with his top laner, we've already seen the bromance between Flame and oh, Dardock yeah. on Twitter and in game. They've had some very good duo performances. So the fact that he's integrating so well with the most difficult players to integrate with, the players that come from a different culture with a different language, is already a step forward for a player that justifiably has had question marks about how he integrates Interacts into a team. Absolutely. And, and for what it's worth, Dardock's previous team was two Koreans as well, playing sure. with Phoenix and Piglet. So at least he's had some training wheels and interacting with foreigners on his team, I think is an appropriate term for that one. Uh, but also what's nice to sort of look at is this game is not flame hard carrying. It's an Immortals game where it's actually the rest of the team, the domestic talent actually doing a lot of the work here. Cody Sun unkilled, Pobelter 5-1 and 2, Dardock, you know, again 11 of 13 KP. Like, it's good to finally see more than just Flame doing all the hard work, and this is a, this is a good looking win here for Immortals if they can close it out. Yeah, I really like the Hecarim pick, it undid the Twitch. It would have been Twitch or Jin, I think both of them equally are kind of answered by Hecarim, especially yeah. if the Hecarim gets ahead. So nice drafting, good clean stuff from Immortals. They're so far ahead now that the poke is really hurting the side of Kongdu, and going to have to be some sort of Miracle Engage or a huge pick, and I just, I just don't see how that happens for Thunder Monster. Yeah, it seems very unlikely, but you never know. One good team fight and Soul can crush people. He's got 50% crit chance. He's working towards that Lord Dominic's regards. He's very close to the combine. Maybe 700 gold based on what's in his inventory right now, and maybe cut through the front line. Flame and Dart. I'm going to look for the dive onto Roach. A little bit of time bought out. 
Attack goes away towards the inhibitor. Let's see if there's more to be had. Roach at 1500 HP. Flame still tanking up in the front line. The Redemption comes off, and Soul is here to get some damage output. But is there really going to be enough done? Redemption heal. A big play comes in. There's the dive as well. Soul has time to open up. Can he kill them all off? He is untouched this team fight. But it's still the Oriana going down. Edge has dropped. The hook's going to land. They find Roach. Soul's still alive. But it's Cody Sun with the triple kill. Looking for more. Looking for the Quadra. Can't quite find the kill onto Soul. But the team fight win is there. It's a four for one in favor of Immortals. That could be the game winning play. Soul has to win this one versus four. Looks for Darda. Gets the kill actually. And now has to heal one more time. Has to reset. Pobelt, they're looking to zone him out. TP back in for Flame. The flash, the follow. Oh. The kill is in there. And game two goes to Immortals. They pull it into game three. We've got a series on our hands. Really exciting to see. And I knew this was going to be a fun one for Egan. I thought that might just be spirited plays by Immortals, but an overall 2-0 to Kongdu. Immortals looked a lot cleaner here. They finally got that out of mid lane tower that eluded them for 20 minutes. They turned